Okay, so now that we have this identity, uh, where I remind you the identity is this one right here, uh, we can use this to do path integrals over fermions. So let's understand how to do that. So the basic idea is exactly the same as for scalars. Let's remember um, the, the action for the free theory of the Dirac fermion, so which you recall from earlier today, was d4x psi bar slash minus m. So um, as an aside, we now understand a little bit better what psi of x is. So what is this object psi of x? Um, in this action, it's a Grassmann valued function of space time. Okay, so it's a map from space time. Oops, say Grassmann valued. Space time. It's a map from space time to the Grassmann numbers. Okay. So another way to say this is the following. Pick some functions, uh, let's call them fn of x, which are a complete basis of functions over space time. So these are ordinary functions, ordinary variables. So for example, you could take them to be just, you know, plain waves, that's fine. Then what you can imagine is that psi of x is a sum over psi n fn of x, where these are ordinary numbers, it's an ordinary function, but the fn are Grassmann numbers. Okay, that's what it means to have a, um, a Grassmann valued function of space time. Okay, so um, now that we understand this, we can formally construct the generating functional for the Dirac theory. The idea is exactly the same as in the scalar theory. We take some sources, eta and eta bar, which are anti-commuting. We do a path integral over psi and psi bar. And the thing appearing in the path integral is the exponential of i of s, psi psi bar, where this is just the free Dirac equation, the free Dirac action from above, plus i, uh, let me put this in the second line, plus the action of the sources on this, so it's integral i d4x times eta bar of x psi of x plus psi bar of x eta of x. Okay. And here, eta of x and eta bar of x are anti-commuting sources for the Dirac field. Okay. Now, um, one important thing here is that there's some extra minus signs to, uh, to stress about. So as usual, we're gonna differentiate this with respect to eta and eta bar to pull down factors of psi, okay? So that we can construct time order correlation functions of psi and so on and so forth. We need to worry about the signs a little bit so um, if we differentiate from the left, then here are some signs, which I spell out in full detail. Integral d4i, so that doesn't contribute the first term, but this one does. Of course, here I'm just writing down the combination of things that appears in the source. This gives you a minus i psi bar, oh, sorry, no i, minus psi bar, of x. That's because I had to anti-commute these two things to get the derivative from the left to work out. And I also have this turns out to be plus psi of x. Again, because this time when acting from the left, I don't have to anti-commit anything. This thing just acts immediately on the eta bar. Okay. So um, 
Now, by arguments that are really exactly the same as for the scalar field, so by the same arguments that we know and love for the path integral, so by the same usual arguments, you can derive relations like this. So for example, the time-ordered correlation function for the fermion field, so that's t psi of x1, psi of bar of x2, is equal to, and here we go, a denominator, which is the partition function, the generating function with no sources turned on, times minus i dd eta bar of x1 plus i dd eta, oh, sorry, x2 times the partition function is a function of eta and eta bar. We're here, this z naught means there's nothing else but the fermion field in here. And you'll notice there's a sign difference here between these two things. Uh, that sign difference is coming from this sign difference here. Okay. So to bring down psi bar versus psi, you have to put a minus sign or not put a minus sign. And as usual, we evaluate all of this when the sources are zero. Okay. So um, this kind of thing is familiar. We take a derivative with respect to a source to get a partition, to get a, a two-point function. So now let's actually compute what this thing is. Let's calculate z naught. And um, we've already done all the work we need to do this in the previous part. To calculate z naught, we use this identity that we've already developed where the role of b is played by the Dirac operator, d slash plus m. So just directly plugging in this formula into the Dirac, uh, into this generating, into this Dirac action, we identify this operator here with b, and we can immediately conclude that the answer is simply that z naught, the function of eta and eta bar, is equal to the determinant of the thing appearing in the action which is d slash minus m times the quadratic combination of the sources with the inverse of the thing appearing in the action. And this takes the form theta of y, okay. where sf, as you might expect, is the inverse of the Dirac operator. In particular, it is i d slash minus m s f of x and y. And so because it's the inverse, it is the identity in all the spaces of interest. In particular, it is the identity in position space meaning that we have a delta of x minus y. Also the identity in spinner space, which I'm just gonna write like this, one, four by four. This is the identity in spinner space. Okay. Of course, this expression is nicer in Fourier space. In, uh, in Fourier space, this same thing looks like this. P slash minus m times S F of P equals to I, okay? Where I'm, I'm neglecting the spinner identity here. And what that of course means is that the direct correlator, the direct, sorry, propagator is I over P slash minus M, okay? So I believe you've seen this expression before. Here, notice that I have a matrix in the denominator because P slash minus M of course is a matrix. And um, this just means matrix inverse, as usual, as you, as you all know. So um, from this expression, of course, we can now construct the two-point function of the fermion field. So in particular, if you plug this thing into this formula, and if you then take these functional derivatives, being very, very careful about the minus signs, then what you find is that the two-point function of the fermion field takes the form this 
it becomes exactly just SF of X1 and X2. Okay. And of course, we usually write this in momentum space where this becomes D4P, P by the fourth, I as the exponential of minus IP by minus two, divided by P slash minus M plus I epsilon. where I put back the I epsilon for the same reason that we had it there in the first place. So again, this is a formula that you're very familiar with. Um, all we've done here is we have computed from the path integral. The new thing here is just that you can view um, this SF as the inverse of the Dirac operator. Okay, okay. very good. So um, I wanna take a second and, and talk about the business of this, uh, this determinant being in the numerator in this expression. So in particular, I mean over here, again, for the normal bosonic field theory, this determinant would have been in the denominator. Here we see it's in the numerator of the partition function. And that is some physical importance. In particular, you remember the zero point energy for the fermion had the opposite sign? That is the same physics as the determinant being in the numerator. Okay. So the fact that the zero point energy of fermions is negative, turns out to be equivalent to the fermion functional determinant being in the numerator and not in the denominator. You can derive the zero point energy from that. And if you're interested in this, I uh, direct you to chapter 2.5 of Tony Z's book on quantum field theory in a nutshell, where this is spelled out in more detail. And uh, this week's uh, tutorial problems also push on uh, some aspects of this a little bit. Okay, so that concludes the formal part of this. And you can sort of get the idea, everything works out pretty much the same as it did for the scalar fields, except with a few extra minus signs here and there. Okay. So to conclude um, today's videos, I just wanna work out the Feynman rules for fermions in a specific example, an example of an interacting theory. section 6.4 in my lecture notes. So I wanna work everything out in an example, in the example of Yukawa theory, which uh, if you recall was a, uh, a theory that had both a fermion and a scalar in it. So the action depends on a fermion field and a scalar field. And that action is the integral d4x psi bar times i d slash minus m psi with a fermion piece. There's a scalar piece. Uh, oops. And there's an interaction between them. Psi plus psi times phi. Okay. So um, if you want to derive five minute rules, then as usual, what we do is we expand the full interacting partition function in powers of G, where G here is the interaction between the free Dirac field and the free uh, scalar field. Okay. So let's do that. So expand out Z, which is a function of sources for the Dirac field and the source for the scalar field. And um, this J is really the same source as it was in the earlier part of the lecture. Let me not write down the formulas for that. And if you do that, what we get by, again, exactly the same reasoning that went into the derivation of the Feynman rules in the scalar case are the exponential of the integral d4x times ig. And now I have to put things in here that bring down everything of interest. Uh, this is a long expression, so I'm gonna start it again here. Minus I delta, delta eta bar of X, times Z naught of eta bar, eta and J. Okay. Well, 
where um, here we sum over the spinner indices. So there are some spinner indices A here, which I've put back temporarily. Uh, we sum over these spinner indices. Okay? And um, you know, the point of this is, um, is, of course, just to generate this interaction vertex here, psi bar psi phi. Here, of course, this functional derivative brings down the phi. This one over eta brings down, uh, over eta and eta bar, bring down the psi and the psi bar. Okay. okay. And finally, this z naught here is the free theory generating function. And in particular, that free theory generating function is z naught of eta bar, eta, and j. And it's the exponential of minus the integral d4x d4y. Eta of y, and this is eta of x, and multiplied by the exponential of minus a half d4x d4y. J of x, j of x and y, j of y. So this is the fermion part, and this is the scalar part. Okay. Okay. So you know, again, it should be pretty clear that all of this stuff works just like it did in the scalar thing. You, you expand everything now in powers of, of g and powers of d and so on, powers of eta, eta bar. And for every term, every picture that you can draw, you can associate a term in the perturbation expansion. Um, so for example, here's one of them. Uh, you can draw a picture that looks like this with an eta source, an eta bar source, and a j source. And um, the term corresponding to this is of the form d1 equals to ig, and now you integrate d4x, d4y, d4z, uh, d4w, and what is the term that you get? Well, you have an eta bar of x and a fermion propagator coupling x to y, so this is an x, this is y, and then you have an sf from y to z, this couples eta of z, so eta is defined at z. And finally, you have a propagator df. This is the normal scalar propagator, which I'm drawing with a dashed line here, and couples y and w to j of w. Okay. And um, this kind of thing, of course, works the same as it did for the scalar. So I don't really want to go through all the details here because I believe most of the mechanics of this have been worked out in your QED course already. And almost everything goes through the same way. All the stuff with LSZ and so on is the same. What you have to do is worry about the spinner indices and also be careful about all the signs. Okay. There's really only two wrinkles here. I just want to sort of focus on the wrinkles rather than going through this in full detail. The first point here is that fermion lines are oriented. In other words, they have arrows on them from the outset. Okay. And this is not really because they're fermions. It's because they're complex fields. And so uh, their particles are different from the antiparticles. You have to keep track of that information. So you need to give a convention for this. The convention I'm going to use is that the arrow points towards the source. Uh, sorry, I can tell you which source, but it points towards the source eta bar. Okay. And eta bar was the source for the field uh, psi of x. All right, so um, that's the convention that I use, which is why this is drawn in this manner here. This is why the arrow is pointing towards the eta bar bit over here. It's also important that at the interaction vertex, you have one arrow coming in and one arrow going out. That, of course, is because the interaction vertex is of the form psi bar psi. Okay? So it's important to keep that in mind. The interaction has one arrow in, one arrow out. Okay. And um, another important thing is that closed fermion loops come with a minus sign. This is very important. Okay. 
So um, there's various ways to see this. One way to think about it is that the, um, the determinant, this functional determinant, basically captures the physics of all the closed fermion loops. And the logarithm of that determinant contributes with the opposite sign than in the commuting case. So it might make sense that we have a, an opposite sign here. There's a, a more pedestrian way to see this. I'm going to now brutally point, show you this by uh, carefully keeping track of all the signs. So let's consider this diagram. Consider, for example, uh, the diagram like this. Okay, where um, this is a scalar propagator, and this is a fermion loop. So let's um, let's carefully evaluate the sign structure of a contribution to this. So I want to do the following abbreviation here. De delta one is the functional derivative with respect to x i, and here delta bar i is the functional derivative with respect to eta bar at x i. So now associated with this, if you go through it carefully, you'll see that we have a term which takes the form dx1, dx2. Let me now get this carefully correct. There's a delta 1, delta 1 bar, and a delta 2, delta 2 bar. And that acts on something of the form eta dot s dot eta, sorry, eta bar dot s dot eta, and again, eta bar dot s dot eta. Okay. Where this pattern of functional derivatives and contractions comes from the action. So it's really fixed. It's really this. And I'm not keeping track of all the all the um, kinematical factors here, the g squares and so on. I just want to focus on the sign. Okay. And the point is that the pattern of contraction of derivatives here will always result in an extra minus sign over the scalar case. Let's try to do this carefully. So for example, if I call this point 1 and this point 2, okay, so here 1 and 2 are, I mean this x1 and x2, then let's try to carefully keep track of how to take these derivatives in order to make the two fermion propagators form a closed loop. All right. So for example, let me first say that this delta 2 acts on this eta bar 2. Okay. Now, because the fermion propagator goes from 2 to 1, that's what the fermion propagator is doing, um, that means that the other one, the other eta derivative, must be acted on by delta 1. Okay. And that kill that tells us what the other ones are doing. That means that this delta one bar must be acting on eta bar here, and this delta two must be acting over here. Okay. Okay. Now let's keep track of how many minus signs we get when evaluating these derivatives. So from the first one, we get no minus signs because this can just act immediately here. So we have a factor of plus. The delta two acting. Uh, on this guy over here, that one is going to go through two extra Grassmann variables, eta and oops, eta and eta bar, and so again we get a positive sign. We get a minus sign for each of those. Next, this delta one acting here is going to go through one minus sign because it has to go through this eta. Sorry, it has to go through this eta. And so we get an extra minus one. And finally, the very last guy here, this delta one, does not have to go through anything because we already took the derivative of this already. And so we just get a plus sign. And so we have overall a single minus sign left over. Okay. And this was a, a brutal direct evaluation of signs. This always happens every time you have a closed fermion loop. Okay. Okay. So, um, Basically, let me just summarize this then. All of the new physics in, um, in evaluating these Feynman rules takes the following form. Um, every fermion propagator comes to the factor of i over p slash minus m, and every propagator has an arrow on it. The arrow denotes the flow of charge. In the Yukawa theory, we have a vertex which comes to the factor of ig. Okay which takes in a fermion and spits out a scalar. Uh, for more general theories, it's quite easy to figure out what this factor should be by looking at the, the term in the action that generates it. And finally, every closed fermion loop comes with a minus sign. Okay. All 
Okay, so um, that basically concludes our whirlwind tour of fermions from the path integral. Let me now just comment on, on one thing. You see, um, all the difficulty of doing quantum field theory comes from doing loops, okay? Because loops are hard, so loops are the hard part of Q of T. Now, this minus sign here sort of suggests something intriguing. You know, wouldn't it be nice if every time we had a, a sort of a boson loop, we had a corresponding fermion loop that would just cancel it out? That's a possibility because every fermion loop comes with a minus sign. And you know, that would be nice if we could argue they always cancel. Then we wouldn't need to do any of these loops in the first place that always just cancel out and give us zero. And we could have stopped this course after the first week. Now, um, that will of course only happen if there was some sort of symmetry that related boson loops to fermions. And in fact, you can see that it could only really work out if the loop diagrams had exactly the same magnitude. So all the couplings and all the masses of the bosons must be the same as of the fermions. So such a miraculous symmetry does exist. It is called supersymmetry, okay? And supersymmetry does exactly this for you. It relates bosons to fermions in such a manner as to uh, basically make many of these loops cancel out. And this is a, a really nice and very beautiful symmetry, which is very important. Next term, you'll take a course on this, taught by Benjamin Hoare. But um, basically, um, uh, this is a beautiful and important idea. Sadly, nature does not seem to be uh, using it as much as it could have been. Okay. That concludes fermions. In the next lecture, we're going to move on to gauge theories.